right, so we are live. Okay, we are live. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, we're just getting started here, so we'll see. Um, please feel free to say hi in the comments. Let us know if you're here or not. Um, welcome to the evening. Um, just so everybody knows, from a housekeeping point of view, we're going to be saving our questions till the end of the presentation. Oh, I see Luke's popped on. Hello, Luke. Yes, people who don't have Facebook can access this. Um, uh, you can do it through Facebook Live um, if you share the link with them. If they don't have Facebook, we will be posting this on our YouTube page afterwards. So if anybody's wondering about that, all right, I see we've got people coming in saying hi. Glad everyone's looking forward to this evening. Oh, a very snowy Hamilton Mountain. We actually have snow down here in Leamington where I'm at, so, um, which, you know, isn't always the norm for us. So, uh, welcome everyone. We've got lots of people popping in. Oh, we got people from New Brunswick, Toronto. Oh, somebody said their big revelation this summer is that ringbill gulls have different coloration over their first four years. So, okay, welcome everyone. Well, I would like to take this uh, time to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm Sarah Rupert. I am a board member for the Ontario Field Ornithologists. I'm going to be your host and moderator this evening. And I'm really pleased to have everyone here on this nice night. It's a good night to cozy in and learn about gulls. And we have the perfect person for us uh, tonight to help us with all of this. Um, Justin's a good friend of mine. We've been birding together for a lot of years now. And I will tell you that his passion for gulls, um, I think, was only eclipsed in my life by my dad. So he has an incredible wealth of knowledge about gulls um, and nature in general. Um, you may have met Justin in a past life at Algonquin. You might have seen him guiding bird tours at Point Pelee in the spring or with Quest Nature Tours or even as the past president of the TOC. He's a very well-rounded individual, and I'm happy to have him here tonight, and he's gonna share his passion and love of gulls with everyone. So, welcome Justin, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, thank you to, uh, thank you very much to uh, Ofo for uh, inviting me to present this talk tonight, and it's a talk that I've presented, well, in different forms over the last few years. Uh, usually we're at Niagara Falls on the eve of the uh, famous Gull Weekend, but uh, of course uh, that event is not happening this year, but that's okay. We can join together this way, and um, tonight I am looking very much at speaking about uh, gulls, and uh, yeah, I titled this presentation Introduction to, to Gull Identification. Um, you know, you may be uh, a more, let's say, um, advanced birder. You may find something, I think, uh, possibly helpful in this presentation. So welcome to all uh, all levels of birder. And even if you consider yourself a beginner, uh, I hope to give you a little bit of a taste or um, an appetite, let's say, for gulls and what makes gulls interesting. In, in the case that you've decided to sort of keep a wave or hold back, withhold yourself from gulls, uh, I would say, I mean, I really find gulls fascinating to look at. Uh, they are, I think, very beautiful birds. Now, you might not be quite at the, the stage of considering them beautiful. I think uh, we do have sort of, um, you know, a, a, something we're working against in, in society at large, and that's the idea that, you know, all, all gulls are seagulls. And I have to tell you a, a funny true story today is uh, Andrew McTavish, in Hamilton, he sent me a couple of photos of a, a rare gull that showed up recently in uh, at Mohawk Lake in Brantford. And so strong is this whole notion of, you know, the generic seagull and gulls are just, you know, they're all seagulls that uh, even Microsoft considers gulls, seagulls, just generically seagulls to be 
um, sort of the, the, the general state of affairs. And just to prove that to you, when Andrew sent this photo, here's the photo when I inserted it into my, my presentation into PowerPoint before I expanded it to fit the size of the slide. And Microsoft uh, PowerPoint provided me with a suggested text to accompany this photograph of a mu gull at left with a heron gull. And it said, alt text, a flock of seagulls are swimming in a body of water. This is, uh, this is a Mohawk lake. So, um, so yeah, so there's, there's sort of this generic seagull thing. All the gulls are seagulls. You might think that all of them look the same. Uh, you may have sort of a, a ill feeling about gulls as well. Perhaps they've attacked you or, uh, you know, stolen your fries. There is something kind of threatening about gulls, which is scary. <laughs> like this uh, glaucous wing gull in Vancouver. Um, it's kind of scary, but it's kind of, kind of cool. I don't know. I find it sort of attractive. Even the more maybe attractive gulls can look kind of threatening. And, um, some gulls, like the swallowtail gull, considered the most by some the most beautiful gull in the world, and the Galapagos can look menacing. So gulls always they have this kind of bad image. I think about them, even the really really pretty ones, and you know they don't really care for us. I mean, the most they care about us is really to perhaps to get our food. I met this uh, this California gull at the A N W in. Um, Drumheller, Alberta, and it was, you can see its eyes, it's looking inwards, it's focused, it wants my onion rings. In fact, I did provide it with one. So, uh, you know, they have this, this gung-ho attitude about them, which I really appreciate. Now for you, I mean, another maybe challenge is just of getting into gulls is the, the sense that they all kind of, well, I don't want to say they look the same, but you might have that impression because here you are, you come to a place and, you know, this is the scene you see, and supposedly there's a number of gulls species here, but you look and it's just like, Ugh, where do I start? And so it's, it's understandable if you've avoided them, and I found this avoidance uh, around the world. I am very fortunate to travel for, you know, looking at birds, and I always look for gulls. Uh, and this is a story I told at last year's event in Niagara Falls, but I like telling it again in case you haven't heard it. Um, I went in, uh, it was in November 2018, I was in London, England, and I went to this uh, bird reserve right in the city, and there were some introduced, you know, captive geese like these, and there were gulls galore, there were gulls all over the place, everywhere really, and, um, you know, there's the black-headed gull, there were, um, there's a, a series of ponds in this reserve, so number of different species. And from one point, they have these hides or blinds, or they call it a hide, that you can look out at the birds uh, without spooking them because you're, you're behind glass. And so you can kind of get close to the birds without scaring them off. And inside this very well-appointed hide uh, was a scope, a telescope, pointing at the this island here with these birds. And I'm looking out and I'm seeing, you know, I count five species of gull out here. And the attendant of the hide, this is how well they're, they're um, you know, how well they're, they're uh, equipped here is that they have a person on staff who's at the hide, uh, who's, who has the scope set out and is telling you about the kinds of birds you can have. And this, the attendant, uh, his name was Ian, and he was there and he had a whiteboard behind us opposite the scope and the whiteboard on the whiteboard, he, was, he had written down which birds were here at the reserve that he could see from the blind. And I looked at this list, I looked at it carefully, and I noticed there were no gulls written here at all. There were five species of gull, but there were there was not even a single one. It wasn't, seagull wasn't even written here. And so I asked the, the gentleman, Ian, I said, Ian, I noticed there are no gulls written on your list. And he said in his wonderful English accent, oh, you're not one of those, are you? And I, I was taken aback, like, yes, I am one of those. <laughs> I do like to look at gulls and, and there are, in fact, I didn't quite tell him this, I just left it alone, but there are in fact five species here. So if you have this inhibition, it's per perfectly understandable. What I hope to do with you today is to maybe give you a little bit more of a, a little bit of a handle on gulls and maybe different ways of thinking about gulls and looking at them that can give you, give you some more confidence at identifying gulls and just to make gull 
watching and the gull experience fun. And I mean, they are really beautiful when you look at them. Some of them are, you know, are more exotic looking when you get to see them in other locations, but really all gulls are beautiful. They're, they're everything, everything about them I think is, is, is fascinating. Their, their heads and their, their bills and their, their coloration, their plumage. And gulls can f make for some of the most uh, incredible spectacles of uh, nature as well, like these beautiful Franklin's gulls in South America. And darn it, gulls are tenacious. And this gull here in Vancouver, Stanley Park, is, is going to swallow this starfish. So um, I think gulls have a lot to uh, offer. And uh, today I hope to, to look at some of these um, many different aspects with you. And luckily, and I do think, and I, I think, I hope you can appreciate, even by looking at this gull here, which is an adult herring gull, gulls are visually interesting to look at. When you really stop and look at them, the point is stop and look at them. They're really fascinating and I would say um, haunting looking birds. So there's, there's I, think, I think if you just allow yourself to be drawn in, uh, you, will, you will find that they're, they, they will suit you quite well. Now, um, for me, I mean, I've been birding basically my whole life. I grew up looking at bird books and, uh, you know, basically kind of memorizing what the birds looked like before I had ever seen them. So for me, I look at gulls a certain way. Uh, you know, I never really had a system of like, how do I think about how I identify gulls? Because I've just sort of get a, a feel for them and, and a sense of, you know, what, what the proportions are that I learned that, uh, a lot uh, in my youth. So I really develop a system for learning how to, how, how to identify gulls. I don't know, I don't, I don't really, I didn't really have to think about that. But, um, you know, I happened to find uh, some, year, some years ago, say 15 years ago, this, this really interesting book, which I found in the uh, bargain book section of the chapter store, which I'm gonna show you and, you know, I'll show it to you later because I think every kind of big, you know, novice beginner birder should probably get this book because it's an excellent book. It is called Identify Yourself, The 50 Most Common Birding Identify Identification Challenges by the late Bill Thompson III. Excellent book. I don't know what, what really drew me to it, but this book contains basically 50 chapters on um, groups of birds or pairs of very similar species that, that are often challenging for many people like the hairy woodpecker and the downy woodpecker. Now, you may know how to identify them when you see them, you may just know it, but this book really breaks down those challenges and gets you to look different. Like, you know, I never even thought about that or even never even noticed that. Like, I feel like I could identify these birds with just the way they look, but how would I, you know, describe that or, or explain that? Well, this book, for me, in terms of gulls, was kind of a, a revelation because... Bill Thompson, the author, he just broke down gull identification into uh, you know a few different, <coughs> uh, if you want to call them steps or or uh, just different ways of thinking about how to identify gulls, and it, it got me thinking differently. And I, I would say it accelerated just my own understanding of how how would you go about identifying gulls. And so I think. This is a great book to have. Today, what I would like to do with you first is like actually just look at some of those things he presented. And when I say you, you kind of have to accept these things first, you have to allow yourself to think that gulls can be interesting. Once you do that, once you accept them, you'll find that you can grasp these, these notions as well. So these are the three things he said. Number one, gulls are highly variable. Number two, Gulls vary with age, sometimes tremendously. And number three, rare gulls are rare. These things sound very simple, and really, they are. And um, I mean, when if you get the book, you'll you'll see some examples of of different different uh, kind of uh, different. You'll see different comparisons of gulls, different ages, and such. We won't get into that, but I'll just say gulls are highly variable. Now, what does that mean? Well. That means that any species of gull, for example, you will have, you'll, you'll never have two birds that look the same, that look quite the same. Um, for whatever reason, I mean, your, your one northern cardinal will look very much like the next northern cardinal. But when, with gulls, when you start looking at them closely, you see there's a lot of variation. And, you know, uh, 
one example is, uh, for example, this one right here of Iceland gulls, which I photographed in St. John's, Newfoundland uh, one year. And it, Iceland gulls happen to be a highly variable species. So they're particularly variable. But just to show you, all of the gulls on this, on this wall here by St. John's Harbor are the same species. And there's this one here with kind of a slightly dusky eye, kind of lightly streaked head. Um, and the one in front of it right here, darker eye, more of a gray hooded look to it. Um, the legs are a little bit grayer than the first bird, which is a little bit more pink, but they're the same species. So gulls are highly variable, just accept that fact. Um, not only are, you know, is one bird uh, different from another individual, even, you know, side by side, um, gulls can vary with, uh, with their sex. So male birds tend to be larger than female birds, maybe larger and kind of more uh, um, uh, threatening looking, perhaps just in the proportions of the head. Um, you know, they can vary with the time of year. So a common gull, like this ring-billed gull, which is your classic McDonald's gull, uh, in the winter, it tends to have, I mean, it should have a lot of gray streaking on the head. And it has a bit of a red eye ring. You can see a little bit of red here at the side of the, of the bill, the gape. But in, in spring, so this photo was taken in, in January, uh, you know, the same bird in late March can look like this. It has actually uh, replaced the feathers on its head. It has lost the streaking, so it's mostly white head. And the, the colors around the eyes, the skin has actually intensified. So you have variations in seasons like this, in um, you know the plumage, appearance, of just the head, the face, um, and you know this gull here, California gull. This was the one I met at A and W in uh, Drumheller, Alberta. In late June, this bird, its plumage would be very, very worn. You can see this bird looks really ratty. But the same bird in late August, a bird that's molted, can look remarkably fresh and sort of prettier. Looking. So there's a lot of variation in, in many different dimensions of gulls. So it's just something you have to, to accept. Um, you don't auto, have to automatically assume, well, it looks somewhat different, therefore it's a completely different species. I'm going to come back to that notion in a bit. You know, sometimes you find very strange things. Um, cases of variation, like these two gulls are uh, lesser blackback gulls, which I saw in Senegal on the west coast of Africa. Check out the bird on the right and look at its two legs for a moment and you'll see here the one leg is, i mean the legs on this gull should be yellow basically yellow but um the leg on the right is clear the, the bird's left leg is clearly differently colored than the right leg i don't know what's going on um it's just this bird is different and look at the heads on these two birds i mean they're they're different as well just the the, the uh the amount of streaking on the head so they're, they're just variable, they're both the same species. So um, number two in a few things to accept about gulls, gulls vary with age, sometimes tremendously. So I think uh, Sarah at the beginning uh, was referring to a comment from someone uh, who's, who's attending tonight, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, that you know, ring bill gulls vary with age. Well, yes, gulls vary with age, sometimes tremendously. What does that mean? Well, if we're looking at the ring bill gull, for example, this photo was taken at Tommy Thompson Park on the Les Leslie Street Spin Toronto. The two birds here are the same species. Now, I happen to know that, I mean, the bird on the right is an adult that has the gray back and the white, basically the white body, yellow legs. Uh, I, I happen to know this is the adult because it has just fed the bird on the left. But had I not seen that happen and it had this bird on the left, which is a, a juvenile recently fledged, just been sitting beside the bird on the right, it wouldn't be necessarily obvious that they're the same species, but they are. So gulls vary with age tremendously. We'll get into, uh, into that a little bit more. And the third thing is that rare gulls are rare. And I'm emphasizing rare gulls are rare. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is no matter where you are, there are probably very few species of gull which are common. And so that means there isn't really that much variety you can expect. And that might sound a little bit depressing, like if you're, if you're a lister or you want to see a lot of different species, you're not necessarily going to find a great variety of gulls, certainly um, in a short period of time. 
over the course of a year, depending on where you live, you might see a lot of gulls, but most gulls that you can see are belong, belong to a small number of species. Now, here's a list that I have here that are um, basically covers, I think, almost all, all or, mo or most of the gulls you, you might expect to see in Ontario in a given year. Um, you could see these at Niagara Falls, uh, probably not all of them <laughs> on the same day, maybe 14 of these you can see on the same day. But this is a, this looks like a big list, but the fact is that generally in Ontario, in terms of the species that are common, it's really a um, very small number. So coming back to that photo by Andrew McTavish of the Mugal here on the left, which was at uh, Mohawk Lake and Brantford, and previously we assume it's the same bird that was in Niagara Falls. This bird is rare. So we can't go out every day expecting there's gonna be a mugal. It's it's once in a blue moon. It's a once in a blue moon sort of event. It's a rare bird. Uh, the, the herring gull, the herring gulls around it are much more common and we expect to see them in the right location kind of all the time. So to come back to that list, really there's four, four species here. The first four that are in yellow, herring gull, ringbill gull, bonaparte gull, and great black-backed gull that we know are, they're expected species, you know, they're in, in the right locations, they're common to abundant, um, of course, depending on time of year. The rest of the species are generally rare. Uh, some of them certainly we expect uh, every year, but they're in small numbers, relatively small numbers. So that might sound a little bit, depressing, as I said, if you're looking for a lot of variety, but this is kind of a good thing. This is a good thing if you're trying to get a handle on how do I identify the gulls that I have near me? Because, I mean, this is a scene here. I went birding once with Marcy Jacklin uh, in the, along the Niagara River, and this is a scene we came across here with, um, I believe we have three gull species in this group. Only, and I say this, only three species of gull in this group. Two of these species are, you know, one, are in the one to four category. And there's one rarer, uh, rarer gull here. So there isn't too much you actually have to deal with in terms of species diversity. So those are a few things to accept with with gulls, and um, as I said, if you believe me, they're they're a good thing. Now, if you have all this variety, all this uh, you know variation within a species, variation in age, um, you know how do we how do we grasp how do we where do we start really? Well, there's another thing, another uh, set of shortcuts and things to accept. This is from um, the same book. Two shortcuts here, there are, number one, there are three sizes of gull, large, medium, and small. <laughs> and if you, and, and I have them uh, listed here, uh, large examples would be herring gull and great blackback gull. In medium, your you know, prototype medium gull in Ontario would be the ring billed gull. And number three, your small gull, your typical or expected small gull would be uh, the, the Bonaparte skull. And so this covers, these are the four species that are at the top of that list of gulls that you should really get to know in Ontario. And so what do they look like? Well, they, they vary with age. We'll look at that in a moment. But the herring gull, this is a nice, uh, nice adult herring gull, yellow bill with a red spot, pink legs, gray mantle and upper parts, this is in the winter. This photo was taken at Minutes Point in Barrie or near Barrie on Lake Simcoe recently. And sort of in the winter, a, a gray streaked head, orange yellow orbital skin around the eye. That can be important. Black, basically black wingtips uh, primaries, which are the, the, the longest part of the wing with white dots at the tip. Your prototype. Medium sized gull is the ring billed gull, which is your McDonald's uh, junk food scavenging gull. Um, this is an adult in breeding condition, uh, unstreaked head here, in the winter has streaked head. Yellow legs, the, the, the yellow becomes more intense in the breeding season. Red carmine uh, skin around the eye and red or red or carmine gape, the skin here. And your typical or prototype small gull 
would be the Bonaparte skull. This is uh, this is a Bonaparte skull in winter plumage or non rain plumage at um, the uh, at uh, the, the lake shore in Barrie. It's a great place to look at gulls right now. I'll talk a lot about that later. But this is your typical typical small gull. Very interesting uh, wing pattern here on this adult bird. You have this kind of white. It doesn't show as well here, but the front of the wing contrasts with this part, the gray part of the upper upper side of the mantle. Um, and it's, they have like a white wedge here at the front, which can show quite strikingly when the bird is flying. It's a small gull and by small, it's, it's, it's small, it's, um, it's smaller than a mallard, quite a bit smaller. Here's one, this is a, an image, a, a first year bird. I'll talk more about that later, but you can see compared to size. Now, how would you know if a, if a gull, like if you're looking at a gull and you don't know what it is, um, how would you kind of categorize it yourself? Well, very often you have gulls that are together or near other birds. So use those opportunities to kind of decide, is that a small gull? Um, and in this case, you see that it's it's a, a small size gull, not, not a little gull. Never call a small gull a little gull unless, um, unless you know it's a little gull because that's an actual species name. So you have a small gull here. Um, just to show you the differences in size too, uh, in March, I was at Humber Bay Park East, uh, birding, physically distancing from others. And there was this wonderful chorus of two mated pairs of rainbow gulls, which were going at it. They were squabbling over, I don't know what, they weren't gonna be nesting on this dock, but they were just squabbling, having a, a good old time, fantastic entertainment for me. And they weren't attacking each other, but there was a lot of posturing going on. And, you know, the size, I mean, I'm looking at them all. I mean, I know they're a medium-sized gull, but what does that mean? Well, a herring gull was coming in from Lake Ontario with a, a freshly caught fish. And it just, it just, it seemed like the herring gull was being kind of a jerk and just decided to rain on this party of squawking rainbow gulls and basically plopped itself right in between these two couples of rainbow gulls, which caused them to stop um, squabbling. And it plopped themselves down here and with its prize. And <laughs> then you got a sense of, okay, that rainbow gull, those rainbow gulls here now at the back with their yellow legs, they're, they're medium size. Cause when I see them next to this herring gull, okay, that's, that's a large gull with pink legs. And you notice that now too. So you have these subtle differences, just keep that in mind. <laughs> But you have small, medium, or large, and you can use cues in your environment to figure that out too. So just it's a matter of just watching um, if you're uh, just starting out with gulls. Now, I said that gulls vary sometimes tremendously with age. And, um, oh, that's the wrong slide there. Um, one shortcut that's, uh, in Bill Thompson's book, number two here, is gulls start out brown and turn gray or black and white. So gulls start out brown and then they turn gray or black and white. <laughs> it sounds like some sort of uh, mantra and it is. Now, what do I mean by that? I'll show you. So basically, so this is a, let's pretend this is, we're looking at our herring gull. This is an adult herring gull in breeding condition, has an unstreaked head in summer. This is at Point Pelee on the tip in the month of May. This is what it looks like. You know, it's an adult, it's white and gray, um, gray or black and white. So it has gray, gray and white. These are the two primary colors of this bird. It's an adult bird. Basically it's all gray on the top here and an all white body. Now, if we back up in time, or if we look at a much younger bird, a bird that's in its, basically its first year of life, it'll look quite different. It'll look like this bird here. It will be very brown throughout, basically starting off brown, as I said there, very brown throughout. Uh, the wingtips, if we go back to the adult, the wingtips on the adult has some white spots on it, but they're basically you know, largely black here. These are dark brown, there's a lot of brown here, a little bit of gray scattered here. Um, the bill is all dark, the eye is dark. If I go back to the adult here, see the eye is cleared, 
come back to that in a moment as well, um, but looks remarkably different. Now, this is where I think the fun part of gull watching begins, because as I said, there, the species diversity isn't that great. But if I go to a basically a, go, a good gull watching site, there's a lot of different ages of of gulls of, of a small number of species. So it gives you an opportunity to really watch and get to know the ages of the birds. Um, why would you want to know that? Well, there might be, bio, you know, bio, if you say biology, you might want to know that. Um, there, you don't necessarily need to know this, but it, it makes it more entertaining and it helps you figure out, okay, what it is, what is it I'm looking at? And I do think um, that that gulls are very entertaining to look at. Uh, it's entertaining to age gulls, which means try to figure out their ages. I'll let you soak this in for a moment here. Hope you find that funny. That is me flying out the window. <laughs> because I think aging gulls and looking at their ages, figuring out how old they are, is very interesting. Why is it interesting? Because it's fascinating, it changes. So gulls start off brown and they turn white and gray or basically white and black. In this case, let's look at the herring gull here to give you an idea. So that the first bird we were looking at is basically this, uh, rather that very brown bird basically is like the bird here at top center. When the bird fledges, when a bird leaves its nest and is striking out on its own, it can fly it'll look like the bird top top left here. It's called the ju juvenile plumage. We're not gonna get into the, the very, very fine points of what that means, but the way this chart works, in time, we're going forward from top and left, top to bottom and left to right. So on the schematic here, the youngest bird is at top left, the oldest bird is at bottom right. And now just visually look at those birds from top, from left to right and top to bottom. And you'll see the bird overall, the body is becoming paler and paler. The head is becoming paler and paler. We don't see the colors here like brown and gray. That's fine, it's not even that important. What's gonna happen over the course of this birds, uh, of, of these stages here is the bird, um, will every every year it'll undergo uh, molt, which is it's gonna replace its feathers. Um, its body feathers, it might replace uh, once or twice twice a year. And that it's, it's because of the molt that we see those changes in the body, uh, in the body appearance in the head and the body itself. And also in the wings, um, the, the long feathers of the wings, so we're talking these feathers here, the primaries and the secondaries here, and the tail feathers, these are replaced basically once a year, usually in the summertime. So the body changes over time, becomes paler, whiter. And the other thing is those wing tips, the, the primaries and secondaries and the tail are also changing as they're replaced. And we see that general difference here. I'm gonna show you some, some, some examples of this. For example, this is a Franklin's gull here. This bird has been out of the nest for a few months. When it left the nest, it would have been quite brown overall. Already it's been molting the scapulars on the back here. The brown feathers have been replaced with gray. Look at these feathers here on the wing. They're quite worn, they're frayed and worn. Now this Franklin skull is a special case with molt in terms of the timing, but a few months later, the same bird, which is, which is molting its body feathers. Um, the top is gray here, but some of those feathers on the wings here have all, are getting replaced with gray feathers. So slowly the upper parts are becoming gray with time and with age. And this is in February. So this photo was taken in November. This photo of a different bird was taken in February. By April, this, the same bird might look quite different. All the brown that was on the wings here, um, it might be gone. And in this case, uh, see these, these wing tips here are very, very dark brown. In this case, they've also been replaced with 
uh, darker feathers with white little wingtips here. Now, as I said, Franklin's skull is a special case, but you see that general transformation in time with, with, with gulls. Um, this is an example by Natalie Robertson. It's a ring-billed gull taken in the city of Toronto. And um, it's, it's about, well, a little under a year old, I think, or just a little over a year old, I'd say. Um, it would have been more kind of brown all over overall with some gray um, over its first winter. This is in the spring, but over the winter would have got more and more gray here on the back and is getting more gray on the wing here. That's replacing brown feathers. And now it's starting to, at this point, starting to molt feathers, the long feathers, primaries and secondaries of the wing here. And some have fallen out right here, the original uh, primaries, and it's getting uh, gray feathers in here. And as the outermost feathers are replaced, they're gonna be uh, black, blacker than these here, which are brown. And the tail feathers will also be replaced, as we can see, less and less brown. And its next molt, and the next tail feathers this bird will wear, they will be more white, there'll be more white on these feathers. There will be dark, but it'll be more concentrated in a narrower, blacker band of uh, feathers. There's a lot of variation, but generally that's what's happening with these birds. And other things change more subtly with age, as a bird ages. Um, this is a glaucous wing gull from Vancouver. Uh, all gulls are, let me think about this before I make that commitment. Well, all the gulls that we have really, um, you know, they're starting off as, as young birds with an all dark bill. The bill is all dark, basically from, you know, when they leave the nest. And depending on the species, in term, the rate depends on the species, but generally what happens with gull bills is the base becomes pale and the pale area extends towards the tip over, over time. Um, also, the, the bill will become pale from the tip as well, inwards towards the head. So this bird here is about a year old. It would have had an all dark bill for, for about a year. And now it's becoming pink from the base and it's gonna become increasingly pink. And the, the tip is becoming pink and it's gonna become increasingly thicker pink at the tip. And eventually the dark area will contract and contract. And the bill base color will also change to yellow. So there's these changes that happen over the age. Um, that's, that's, I know, I understand uh, it could be a lot to absorb. I'll show you some actual real examples showing the progression in a few of these species we know. Now, um, I was talking about the gull sizes. You have large gulls, medium gulls, small gulls. The fun part, <laughs> if you consider this fun, is that the, the time it takes for gulls to go from a, an immature plumage to an adult plumage varies with the size of the gull, generally speaking. So large gulls take about four years to get to an adult plumage. Medium gulls, like the ring gull, take about three years. And small gulls, like the Bonaparte's gull, take two years. And you might have a field guide like National Geographic that will, which is a great guide, you should have it, which talks about gulls being a two-year gull, a three-year gull, or a four-year gull. And this is referring to this, this system I'm talking about, how long it takes for a gull to get to that size. So if you flip to, um, you know, herring gull, it, it should say a herring gull, a four-year gull. That means there's four different sort of general plumages or appearances, I should say, properly, uh, to look at. How would this look in herring gull? Well, there's a single photo which cannot be eclipsed, uh, I don't think, in being, you know, in its spectacular nature. This photograph was taken by Ryan Griffiths, who lives in the St. Catharines area. He took this photo of four different ages of herring gull in the Niagara Gorge, and he was looking down, I think, into the gorge, and there happened to be four individuals of four different ages here, which is spectacular. And knowing that gulls go from basically brown in the youngest age to gray and white in their oldest, at the greatest age, um, which would you say is the youngest bird, and which would you say is the oldest bird? Well, give you a moment to think about that. Um, you have also two other ages here. You have four, four ages of what we call a first year bird, second year bird, third year bird, and basically an adult. 
So the youngest bird is a bird at lower right here, which is basically the brownest overall. Has a very thick uh, brown band on its tail here, brown wing tips, essentially brown all over. Bit of gray, all dark bill. In about a year's time, that bird would look more like this here, which is it has grown. It has some gray here on the back, concentrate on the back. The wings look mostly, however, like the like the, the younger bird here. The, the bill is somewhat pale at the tip or at the base, very dark at the tip. It has a paler head, a bit of gray growing in on the wings. It has molted that original first tail and has new tail feathers, which are have a lot of pure, you know, true white in them. There is pigmentation, dark pigment, pigment in there, but it's black. It's not brown anymore. It's really black, but it's a blotchy tail bent. If we go one more year into one year to the future, we have this bird at left, which is a third year bird. It has molted the, the long feathers of the wings and the tail completely. It has undergone, undergone uh, you know, one to two replacements of you know, body overall. Uh, the tail is basically largely white with a little bit of black here. This is variable, but it has reduced black here on the tail. The, the back here is basically gray. The wings are mostly gray with a little bit of, of brown smudging. And the wing tips are, are, are black. There's a bit of a white uh, mirror here. Um, and you go forward one more year and you have the adult with a pure white tail, basically extensive gray on the, on the, the wings here without any brown smudging, nice black wing tips, uh, primaries here, primary tips with white, white apical spots as they're called here, white, white dots at the tips, pure white tail, um, the clearest really a, a yellow bill with a, a red dot and a bit of black here at the base of the bill. Notice on the third year bird, it's sort of in between, it's kind of yellowish looking, it has more of a clear tip. So just look at that for a second here. This is a glorious photo. Um, if Ryan would let me, I would blow this up and frame this on the wall because it is really, really spectacular. So looking at those birds up close, you can see there's that first year bird again, largely brown overall. Dark eye, I didn't talk about the eye so much, but eyes on, uh, when a, adult girls have pale eyes, um, they will have started off, however, with dark eyes. So darker, dark eye, largely dark bill, largely brown bird with grayish tones. Um, you know, it could something look like something like this in flight. I'm seeing all dark bill here, largely chocolate brown, uh, uh, chocolate milk kind of body. Bird, a bird that's a second year bird, looks mostly like the younger bird, but has the gray coming in on the back here. This foot was photographed in Barry last weekend. Uh, you know, it's a largely dark bill on this individual. And, you know, another one might look like this. Notice the eye is getting pale, L you know, largely pale base here, a bit of pale at the tip, second year bird. Still brown wing tips here, but a lot of brown splotching. A third year bird here, gray here on top, but also a lot of gray on the wings. Definitely a pale eye. The eye has changed in color. Increased pale area on the weight on the, the bill. And you know, you see that the, the tip is pale for sure, but less, less, um, less black. Here's the, the second year bird with a lot of black. Third year bird, a little bit less black here. In flight, it might look like this largely adult looking, largely gray on top, and um, you know, a little bit of brown smudging here, clear eye as well. And overhead, it might look like this. This one has a you know, fair amount of black in the tail still, clear eye. It looks very adult-like. I don't see the top of the wing, but certainly with that tail band of black, I can see that it's not quite an adult, but it looks mostly like an adult. And it uh, will look like this. This is a, this is a winter, adult bird with a lot of brown, which is coming, a lot of streaking on the head or smudging um, in the winter as you might see it. And um, so there you have it, just basically the, the look of these birds. So, but I think, I hope you have a, a handle on this. Now, to make it simple, uh, you know, it's the same idea with a medium gull. 
with uh, like a ring bill goal. It just takes three years to get to maturity. So once again, the adult looks like this, basically a white and gray bird. <laughs> um, ring bill gulls, unlike the herring gull, because they're smaller, they progress more quickly towards the adult-like look. So in their first fall, in the first year of life, they're, they're, they're very brown when they leave their nest, but they quite quickly start getting gray feathers on the scapulars here. You see a dark eye. The bill is, is basically a pink bill with a large black tip here. And in time, uh, the, same, the same bird, but later in the winter, um, could look like this, somewhat more gray on the wings here, but a lot of gray here. Brown, dark brown wingtips compared to an adult here at the rear. Here's a comparison of an adult at top with a, uh, with a first year bird at bottom. The adult clear white tail. The, the first year bird, a you know, fairly broad brown band and a lot of brown in the underwings here and on the body. Um, a bird that's a, a second year bird, a year older, will look very much like an adult bird. So there's an adult here at right, all gray here, all white body. Black, black wingtips with white apical spots. But the first year bird, notice it has a little bit of brownish on it, on the wings, kind of smudging in it. So it's not a pure, nice, clear gray. The Look at the leg color. The legs are different. They're yellow, like, like they are for the adult, but much less intense, sort of grayish. The bill is not as intense. The, the, the black band, the, the bill has turned from pink to yellow but it's not really as intensive yellow and the, 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 the black ring, it has a pale tip now here to the bill, but the black ring is not quite as narrow as on the adult. The eye is darkish as well. The wing tips can be quite black, but if they've had any white apical spots, they're very they're minimal or they've, they wear off quickly. So it just looks subdued. And that bird could look like this too. Um, first year bird or rather second year bird, Still, this one has a bit of a darker eye. Um, you see here some now some brown smudging on it, and the tail is white, but it doesn't have a it doesn't have a thick brown band in it, a broad brown band. It has a reduced black band in it. So in flight, this bird might look more like this here, with reduced black with reduced black banding. But there's there's some color, there's some pigment there, so you know it's not an adult. Very uh, fairly extensive dark on the wings here little bit of dark scattered throughout the body. This, the eye on this bird looks quite pale. And a different view might be like this. So a uh, different bird, reduced black banding, but it, there's sort of a broken black band here. Some brown coloration in the other sides as opposed to clear pale as you would have in an adult. And this is uh, an adult bird over here, clear eye, yellow legs, um, nice, yellow bill with an, a definite dark bill on this ring bill gull. So let's just do a little a mini warm up here and you can tell me, um, I can't see your comments, maybe Sarah can moderate, but you can tell me what ages these ring bill gulls are. Would this be a first year bird, second year bird, or an adult bird? I'm seeing, uh, this one is a very white bird uh, on the body underneath. The tail is really white. There's a black there's a black band. It's not complete across the whole tail. It's sort of reduced, and um, there's a little bit of white uh, white some white spots in the wingtips. But the black and the tail tells me automatically it's a second year bird. What about this bird? This bird was at Wheatley Harbor by Lake Erie. Um, this is actually in the spring, um, but I see kind of a, a yellowish, a little bit of yellowish to the bill, but still a pink to it, a pink tone to it. I see a dark eye and the tail. I don't really see a discrete black band. I just see sort of a smudged out brown tail from what I can tell here. The wingtips look quite dark brown. That'll be a first year bird. What about this one? Um, we'll think about it, think about it. Quite gray, upper parts excessively gray, but brown tones here, white tail with kind of reduced black broken band, uh, band here. Whoops, that would be a second year bird. This bird here at um, 
the harbor in Barrie, Ontario last weekend. It is a, uh, what is that? Well, it has a pink bill. Uh, the tip is barely pale. It's, um, the legs also are pink, and it mentioned that. A lot of brown underneath, a lot of brown here up here on the top. That's a first year bird. This bird here. I'm seeing largely gray on top, some gray, uh, some brown on the body. The eye, it's hard to tell. It is sort of darkish. The bill looks almost adult-like, but I'm seeing this dark area extending away from the wingtips down over here. And when I see that, that I'm, I can tell that that would be, that's a second year bird. Look at that. A lot of gray, but the bill is definitely largely pink. And the eye is dark. I see a definite brown on the tail, dark brown wingtips. That is a first year bird. What about this? Second year bird. And this one should be, I think, straight for now. A lot of gray, but a lot of brown. Brown wingtips, thick, broad brown on the tail, dark eye, a lot of dark on the bill. That's a first year bird. So I think you, you have it in terms of um, sort of getting the sense of what to look for. I hope you do for sure. Uh, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. There are, of course, always some, some variations. So as I said, you know, gulls generally, they're going from dark eyes to light eyes with age. There are some exceptions like the California gull here. This bird happens to be wet. It is beside ring-billed gulls over here on the left. The tail is all white. This is definitely an adult bird, but as an adult, it has a darkish eye. Um, another species of gull, you know, we're talking about but gulls that usually have black wingtips as an adult, but some gulls, like this bird here in the front, this is an Iceland gull, it's an adult. Um, they're a highly variable species, uh, but when they do have pigmentation, it, it may not be black. It can be black, but it, it may be gray, and this is still an adult bird. It's definitely not brown, it's just gray. But you see the whole top here is gray on top. There's no brown smudging in that at all. And some birds, some others, like uh, the Glaucus gull as an adult, has no pigmentation in the wingtips at all. So it's all white wingtips here, otherwise all gray on the top, a nice pale gray. If it had black wingtips, it might look almost like a, you know, a herring gull, but it's not. And other exceptions, there are a few adult gulls that have a, a definite black band, narrower or broader, on the tail as an adult. For example, the well-named black-tailed gull. It's an East Asian species. I think our first record in Ontario was uh, spotted by Brandon Holden at Port Burwell, I think, on Lake Erie. An account of that was written by Brandon in Ontario Birds, the Journal of OFO. And you see a nice image of an adult here, uh, uh, an illustration, but a nice black band on the tail. So don't always, you know, always look at the whole Gull. This one happens to be sort of distinct, have a distinctive looking bill, but always look closely. There are always some, some exceptions. And to go back to that, to our last group of gulls with, with aged small gulls, easy peasy. They take two years to, to maturity. Uh, the Bonaparte skull is, is the expected, you know, most common small gull we'll have at any time. And so as an adult, this is an adult, you know, clear white tail, basically clear white upper parts. This is an adult in the non-breeding plumage. In breeding plumage, they have an all black head. But most of the time, we're seeing them down here in uh, the non-breeding season. If you go to Barry right now, great place to see tons of gulls. You should all go <laughs> physically distance, of course, if, uh, if uh, public safety measures allow. Uh, allow you to visit this spot. It's a good spot to check out. Lots of lots of Bonaparte skull, gulls here to look at, and they're here along with the other gulls hunting emerald shiners, which are these little minnows. And the Bonaparte skulls are experts at plunge diving into uh, Lake Simcoe to to grab these little fish. So it's quite a spectacle. These are the emerald shiners. It's like a, a carpet of them on the water. And so you can see Bonaparte skulls very well. This is an adult perched in non-green plumage, basically all gray on top. White tail here. Uh, this is one in flight, nice white tail. Uh, the legs can vary from kind of pinkish to orange. That's not, uh, I'm not sure really what that means, but um, nice, basically clear underparts here. This is a view of the top with that nice white wedge I was talking about, nice clear white tail. 
as a first year bird, so basically a first year or adult appearances for all intents and purposes. As a first year bird, this is what you will see if you go there and you're seeing them fly around, they'll have um, this brown smudging on, on the wing. So they don't, have a, they don't have clear, they don't have a nice clear upper wing here in this part. And um, they, have a, they have really an extended black trailing edge along the whole wing. Instead of just being here at the tips, it extends along there. But look at the tail. You can see that very quickly. It's a, it's a, it has a nice complete or almost complete black band here. So very, very straightforward to, to see that. And here's a little bit of a closer view. And it's good to really look at where the, the pigment is, get used to that as well. As I said, nice complete black trailing edge here to the wing, essentially on these first year birds. You can get uh, a similar looking gull in Barry right now that looks like this. It's, this is a small gull. Um, it's a, uh, a first year gull, immature, nice black on the tail here, but it doesn't have a black trailing edge, a complete black trailing edge here. Instead it has this black, this, this nice black um, M here, M shape here that you can see here, as opposed to sort of just a bit of smudge here. It's a nice, really broad smudge here. This happens to be your little gull, which is actually called a little gull um, that is seen once in a while in Barry. So generally that's how, those are some things you should look at and think about. Now, there is a book, some of these, uh, this discussion on um, aging gulls, I don't think, I think I passed over the, the name of the book, but there's one book that really discusses how to think about gull ages very well, uh, or in a constructive way. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, okay, um, Justin, you're, you want me to not only think about gull species, but sizes and ages and all this. Um, this isn't something you have to um, master right away. I'm gonna share those books with you because I think if you just get them, you can read them and look at them, and I think you will. Uh, it, it will click. Of course, the recording of this 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 talk will be available on YouTube as well, so you can watch this again. But you know, gulls do take time, and um, really, the important thing about gulls is not to be too quick with them. It isn't about like just going out and you know, I'm going to master this aging thing that Justin talks about, or you know, I'll be able to distinguish this species from that species right away. You need to kind, you need to kind of go and immerse yourself in gulls. Go to places where there are lots of gulls that are visible at close range, and start start with McDonald's, start with Wendy's, or Tim Hortons, wherever you have ringbill gulls. If you go, you know, right now is a great time because you can't eat in, uh, you know, inside your Wendy. So go for takeout. <laughs> Park your car, uh, preferably a, a Wendy's that usually has gulls hanging out, and eat your fries and your chicken burger or your veggie burger, uh, whatever it is, and just watch the gulls. You don't have to feed them. I'm not saying you should feed them, but use the opportunity to look at, at gulls that are near you. Ringbill gulls are by far the most common gulls. As I said, there's a, a small number of gulls that are common. And once you get to just look at them, and look at the variation in the adult ringbill gulls. Try and pick out that one second year gull. Just, there'll be very few of them, but occasionally you'll see it, or the first year gulls. Once you start to do that, get in the habit of just looking for, looking at the mundane, you will find you are, you're, you just get a habit, you form a habit of looking for the important things when you're looking at any gulls and noticing things that are different. I'll just give you an example. I mean, I spend a lot of time looking at gulls when I can uh, here at home in Ontario. And uh, I decided to do, uh, take a gull vacation. I went to St. John's, Newfoundland. In the winter, who does that? I do. And I went to St. John's, Newfoundland in the winter because it is the Iceland gull capital of North America in the winter. The default gull in St. John's, Newfoundland, the most common gull by numbers is the, the Iceland gull. This is an Iceland gull. Iceland gulls are highly variable. It's a highly variable species. And I went there for a week just to just to see them and to immerse myself in them and just get used to what do Iceland gulls look at, look like, and what should I, what am I looking at? And when I say there are a lot of Iceland gulls, there are lots. And you just see them, you see them flying around, you get a sense for how they behave. 
and you see the different ages and just the shapes, the head shape and, and just the variation you see, you know, first year bird like this, you'll see adult birds with very, very pale or white wingtips like this. Um, so different kind of, um, a lot of variation, as I said, you'll see them in flight, and you'll see different amounts of pigmentation. Just get used to them being around you. And unlike Ontario, where Iceland gulls tend to hang out, you know, it's hard to get close to them. In St. John's, they're, you know, 10 feet from you, and they're all around you. So you're just literally surrounded by them. And I was kind of proud of myself, because I went to um, Kitty Vitty Park, which is a park with a large pond, a lake, and it's mostly Iceland gulls. There's some herring gulls. There's some great black back gulls. And I had this moment where I spotted a ring-billed gull. A ring-billed gull that we see in Ontario all the time, all year round in southern Ontario, around your McDonald's or wherever. And I kind of freaked and I had my camera and I don't know why, but I just was like, ring-billed gull. And I took, I took a photo of it and photos, multiple photos of this ring-billed gull, which is considered rare in St. John's in the winter. It is not the default gull in St. John's. And um, I just instinctively took a photo of it. And, you know, I mean, they're not that rare in St. John's, but I mean, they're, they're just, in, you know, they're not that many of them. So it was my first time seeing one among all of these Iceland gulls. And I didn't think about it. I didn't look at it and think, well, I, Yes, you know, this field mark and that field mark and that field mark, therefore it's a ring gull. I just, I just knew it was a ring billed gull because I, I think I was so used to seeing them at home. But I had this frame of reference for these Iceland gulls, which provided me, just let me see what was different, like really different from them. And so, you know, the ring billed gull, which was a first year bird, was here's the Iceland gulls in the background. It was just hanging out. And I just, I, I, just, I don't know, I just had this reaction to it. And, you know, that's kind of fun. And I think you can have this kind of fun with, with gulls too. And to come back to this bird here, the Mew Gull um, by uh, Andrew McTavish. And I think, Andrew, I misspelled your last name. I'm very sorry, I apologize. Um, <laughs> the, the Mew Gull here, which is a rare gull in Ontario. This was spotted at uh, Mohawk Lake, but I think Sarah Lamont, but we believe the same bird had been seen earlier in the Niagara Gorge by Jamie Spence. And this is Jamie Spence. I think that's Jamie. Jamie, is that you? Is that you? Jamie with a ringbill gull. And Jamie, you know, originally when he, he saw the, the mew gull, uh, he sent me photos of this, this mew gull. This is not the mew gull. This is a ringbill gull here. But, um, and he told me a story that, you know, he's been watching ring-billed gulls closely for three years. So the mew gull that he saw was not like this one here. Um, it, I mean, it is that bird, but he didn't see it like that. He saw it down in the gorge. This is way zoomed in here. And, you know, if you look at this bird, like, you know, just in a split second, you might say, well, it's, it's a ring-billed gull. Like it looks like a ring bill gull. In size, it's a medium, medium-sized gull. It does look like a ring bill gull. Um, but you know, he had spent Jamie had spent so much time just watching ring bill gulls at home and wherever intently. So that when he saw it next to a ring bill gull, he just knew it was different. And here's a photo of the mew gull at top and the ring bill gull at bottom. And just I'll let you decide. Um, or look at these two birds, you'll see there is one difference. Um, we should always be careful with the, the shade of gray on a gull, certainly if you see it alone, but he had seen this bird flying around with ring gulls, like right here, and you see that the, the upper bird, the mew gull, is palpably darker than the ring gull at bottom, and that's because mew gulls are darker on top than ring bill gull is just a little bit darker. But he had seen it and also, it's hard to see from this angle, but if I back up to Andrew McTavish's photo, um, there's no ring bill gull in this photo to compare it to, but the mew gull, which is that pigeon headed gull, I mean, has this little round head. And it just had this different, you know, Jamie just had this different vibe. He got this different vibe from this bird. So the difference in coloration on the back and the size and the shape of the head, and therefore um, it's the mew gull. 
So, so it just takes time, but with time you can get <laughs> to uh, you can get to uh, feel more comfortable with dolls. But start with what you have at home. Now, are you ready for a bit of a quiz? Um, it's not too hard, I promise. But I have ten species of gall here. Now there are no prizes, and I don't want it to uh, to mislead you by making you think they're prizes. There are no prizes except you can give yourself a pat on the back. I have ten gulls here, um, not necessarily ten different species. And I'm going to ask you to do a few things with these gulls. I'm going to ask you first of all to give the age of the gull and then the species. Now I will tell you the size of the gull, whether it's a small gull, a, a small gull like a Bonaparte's gull, a medium gull like a ringbill gull, or a large gull like a herring gull or a great black back gull. And then you will um, answer the question. So keep in mind also that we have a very small number of gulls uh, that we expect to see readily in Ontario. This quiz isn't going to be really hard. I'm not going to pick all the rarest gulls here as well. I'm going to pick a, you know, a fairly good, decent representation of what you might see if you went to a, um, you know, a good gull watching location where there are lots of gulls. But I'll, I've thrown a little bit of a uh, little bit of spice in there too for you. So, are you ready? And here we go. Number one, this is a large gull, which means it's a four-year gull. It takes four years to reach uh, adult appearance. So for one point, what is the age? And for one point, what is the species? I guess I better keep track of all the points here myself in case I lose track. So what is the age? What is the species? I see the bird has pink legs as an adult. It has a, a orange yellow orbital around the eye. Nice yellow bill with a, a red spot here. Basically black wingtips with white apical spots on it. Okay, ready for the next number two. This is a medium sized gull. Uh, it was photographed at Point Pili. That helps you. <laughs> it's a medium-sized gull, so it takes uh, it's of a species that takes three years to reach maturity. What is the age for one point, and what is the species for one point? I'm seeing. It looks like a yellow bill with a black kind of. Circle around, circle around the tip of the near the tip of the bill. There's a bit of a glare, I think, from the light from the sun on the bill. The tail looks all white. Hmm. Number three. This is a fun one. Okay, this is a medium-sized gull. This was photographed at Berry by the harbor recently. Medium-sized gull. We don't see all of the bird here, but um, I'm seeing the um, the eye looks, I don't know, a little bit darkish. Can't really, can barely see the tail. The wing seems, you know, the bird is mostly, looks mostly gray on top. Definitely black here, the tips, but I see, I see gray kind of smu uh, blackish smudging rather here away from the wing tips. The bill mostly yellow. Um, Darkish eye, so and so age for one, species for a, a second point, and bonus is what kind of fish is this bird holding? If you're listening carefully, you would have caught the name, or maybe you can just identify. Number four. This is a large gull. This is photographed at Barry. You can see how large it is because it's it can it almost could engulf that cormorant behind it. <laughs> it's huge. And so it's a, a four-year gull. Um, this is one that doesn't have, you know, pale gray on the top. It has like slaty, very, very dark upper parts here. But I don't see, you know, in this case, really much brown on it um, or any brown mixed in with that dark, dark 
almost blackish look. Uh, this girl as an adult has a bit of a dusky eye, usually very small looking beady eye, pink legs. What is that? What is the age? What is the species? Okay, number five. This one is, this would be um, a four year gull. This is an adult. This photo happens to be taken in summertime. Uh, what is the age of this bird and what is the species? Um, I noticed that this bird has basically gray on the whole upper part. So I think the bird might be a little bit wet, white tail. Uh, it has a dark eye. That's very interesting. But basically the body's all white and it's all gray here on top. So this might be a, this might be a little tricky one, but I did talk about it earlier. All right, number six is, this is a small gull photographed at Barrie. Uh, recently, last weekend, I think. And so it's, uh, it would take uh, two years to reach mat mature appearance, basically. Nice all gray on the back, nice white wedge here at the front of the wing here, all white tail. Asian species, please. Number seven. Ooh, this is a funny one. This is a medium sized gull. I photographed this in Barrie in October. Um, so this bird, it's a species that would take three years to reach adult appearance. I'm seeing uh, a lot of brown on the body. I'm seeing, it looks like a dark eye, a real dark eye. The bill is mostly pink with a large dark tip. A lot of, lot of brown in the under parts here. Looks like a brown, basically a brown band or brown on the tail. So Asian species. Ready for number eight? All right, number eight. This is a small sized gull, so it's a small gull, so it takes two years to reach adulthood, and, or adult appearance, I should say, properly. I'm seeing a, a black band on the tail, a lot of black all on the wings. Uh, it does not have a, a black, a solid black leading edge across the back here, however. What is the age? What is the species? And number nine. Ooh, this is a nice one. This is photographed in Toronto in the winter, February. This, it was at Bluffers Park. This is a large gull. So it's a gull, a species that takes four years to reach adult appearance. Um, what do we see here? I'm seeing... Um, well, it has a pale eye. It has sort of dark on top and on the bottom here of the, of the bill tip. The bill is not really yellow. It's still a bit kind of slightly pinkish. Um, the top, the upper parts look basically gray, mostly gray. I'm seeing a little bit of brown though in here. It's a bit of brown in here and um, sort of brown, brownish tones in here as well. It's a little bit, uh, subdued, but um, yeah, and a lot of still black here. So what is the, spe the age of this bird? What is the species? And number 10, the final one. Okay, this is a large gull photograph in Toronto last March. And um, so it, uh, so what is the age of the bird? And what is the species? Now, I'm seeing basically very gray upper parts on this bird. Basically black wingtips. There's, there's white apical spots here, a lot of white here. Um, the eye looks dusky to me. Not really dark, dark, but dusky. Very, very um, pink legs. And it has a, like a pink ring around the eye. It's, it's uh, definitely... Um, pink if I look really intently. So what is the age and what is the species? This one could be a little, little tricky, but it's one you could expect. All right, are we ready for the answers? I hope there will not be, um, no. Uh, there's no need to, to uh, beat yourself up. We will go through these together and uh, everyone's a winner here. So your first bird is an adult herring gull. 
common large goal. Takes four years, it's a four year goal, it takes four years to reach an adult appearance. I'm seeing nice gray upper parts, no brown mixed in there. Nice clear eye, nice all yellow bill with a red dot, red spot at the end. They can get black or can have black beside the red on the bottom. Um, nice pink legs, nice clear eye, that's a nice adult. Number two, adult, ring build, goal. Medium sized goal, takes three years to reach an adult appearance. Uh, nice all white clear body, white underwing here, nice clear, clear yellow eye, yellow bill. It does have a black ring around the bill. The tail, we don't really see it, but it is, it is all white and that's an adult. Okay, how do you do with this one? Number three, for one point the age, one point the species, it is a second year ring build gull. It looks very adult-like, but it has that extensive darkish uh, on these primary coverts here and up here. So more extensive dark bleeding onto the wing. Dark, still dusky eye, not dark dark, but not pale and clear. Um, the, the, the ring around the bill is a bit hard to judge. It is a little bit thicker, almost kind of leaning towards the tip of the bill. Uh, there is a bit of black peppering on the tail. It's hard to see, but with that really extensive dark and darkish eye, it's a second year. Number four for two points. This is an adult great black back gull. One of those top four expected species. I mean, the ones you really should get to know. Huge gull, the largest gull species in the world, a predatory gull, which will kill living, other living things, not just a scavenger. Little beady looking eye, a little bit dusky very often. Um, on a younger bird, this bird, you know, if it were a third year bird, we could expect some um, brownish, some some dark brown feathers mixed in with the the, the uh, with the um, almost black feathers of the mantle with the upper parts here. So it would look a little bit different. You could have more uh, black or black mark towards the bill tip as well on a younger bird. So an adult great black back gull. Number five. This is an adult and with a distinctly dark eye with a red orbital, white tail. <clears throat> it's an adult California gull. I hope you picked up on this when I talked about this bird earlier and the dark eye is an adult. Uh, common breeding species in the West. If you go to uh, the prairies, you can find it. Beautiful, beautiful gull. Really everyone should see a California gull. I wish they all could be California gulls. No, not really. Um, but uh, you, you know, one of them could show up in Ontario. They do once in a while. Number six is a, a small gull, so a two-year gull. This is an adult Bonaparte's gull. Easy peasy. Species you really should get to know. Number seven, ring-billed gull. This is a first-year bird. You notice this one has sort of shredded wing, a shredded wing here. Um, this was an interesting bird because while all the other first year gull, rainbow gulls were on the docks and the uh, harbor in Barrie looking down at the emerald shiners, uh, wondering what to do. And by the way, the bonus point on that other question was emerald shiner, the fish. Um, this one was very apt and was going after the fish and I very, and catching them. Uh, it was seemed way ahead of the other first year rainbow gulls. And I couldn't help but think that it's slightly impeded flight because of this shredded wingtip just made it a fighter and it was gonna survive and it had really learned how to fish very proper, uh, very effectively. Number eight, a small gull, extensive black on the, the front of the wing, no solid black leading uh, or, or uh, trailing edge here. This is the little gull, the first year bird. Number nine, this is a large gull and uh, with some brown, uh, Remaining in the wings, some extensive, uh, um, well, more extensive dark in the, the tip of the bill. This is a third year herring gull. Tricky one. And number 10, this is an adult bird and it is an Iceland gull, um, an expected species in Southern Ontario. Um, in the wintertime in small numbers, this one is bordering on Thayer's gull with that amount of black in the, uh, the wingtip. And, um, you know, 
often a dusky eye with a pink orbital ring. So I hope you did well on that. Um, consider this, if it's your first time being quizzed on Gaul, it's just a first try. I will show you some of those resources you can look for, those books that are no longer in print, I think, but you should all have. First of all, I want to just acknowledge um, the following individuals for their photo contributions to this presentation. Uh, in addition to my own personal photographs, I'd like to thank Ryan Griffiths, Natalie Robertson, Andrew McTavish, and Jamie Spence for their photos. Now, those books I talked about are Identify Yourself, um, because this is being recorded, you can look back at the YouTube recording. This book is no longer in print, but every every birder should have this. Even if you're an advanced birder, like even an expert birder, I would say this is a good one to look at because it makes you think just differently. It gives you some things that that you you can learn from. So I would say everyone should have that. The that chart I, that that diagram I showed with the different goal ages through time. And some of the, the hints I shared as well, I didn't properly acknowledge earlier, but they come from this book, The Complete Burger. Excellent book for any, any burger of any level. A um, lot of nice um, lessons, little, little tricks and things to think about, uh, how to become a more effective field burger are in this book. Now, I, I didn't even try, and I won't even pretend that what I covered in this presentation covers everything you should know or can know about gull watching in Ontario. This is really an introduction and a little taster. Um, OFO has great resources. You can go to the OFO website and if you look under um, learn about birds, you'll find articles and if you look you'll find the gull watching guide which was written by Ron Pittaway and Jean Iron which has, uh, has a little quiz on it as well but it has detailed information on all the expected species you can expect, um, all these expected species in Ontario, notably in the winter, especially in the winter, um, and with notes on, on each species, detailed notes, when you should expect them and what you could look for. And as well as a great selection of locations you can go to, to see gulls. Now, if I recall correctly, uh, Barry, uh, Lake Simcoe, the, the, the harbor Barry is not mentioned here, but um, that is something you should uh, consider as well, the, uh, the, the, the waterfront there in Barry. If you go bring money for the parking, um, you will need it unless you have a permit, but a lot of information here. And if you want to find out what you have around you, if you don't know where your local hotspots are, or if you find, find out what kind of gull species you expect, this is a tribute to Mike Burrell, who's always talking about eBird. Go to eBird.org. Check out Explore Hotspots, and here's the map you'll get of hotspots. Zoom in to wherever you are. Um, you know, I could zoom in if I want to see where do I go. You know, what else can I see in Sault Ste. Marie? Well, if I zoom in, I'll find a hotspot, Sault Ste. Marie, Bellevue Park. And if I go into Bellevue Park, um, I'll find a, a list here. And if I, um, I can click on um, Generate Bar Charts. To, to show what birds, you know, it seems like a lot of birds are seen in this park over a year. Um, if I click to bar charts in this hotspot, it'll show all the bird species that have been recorded and how frequent they're over, over the year. And if I zoom, zoom, you know, scroll down to the gulls, I'll see Bonaparte's gull, ring gull, gull, herring gull, icing gull, glaucous gull. I'll see that from January through December, by far the most common gulls are ring gull, gull herring gull, and everything else is in, infrequent or coming through in a very narrow window. But this tells me ring gull and herring gull are the ones I expect to see most of the time. Herring gull seems to be there all year. Ring gull gull most of the year from late February through until mid-December. UZ bird, you have a lot of information there to tell, to help you know what's near you. And if you're on Facebook, North American gulls is a group that you can join to um, to just see what kind of gulls are being seen across North America. And some of the uh, in-depth challenges or some of the bigger challenges that, um, that face those who want to identify gulls. It might be a little bit in, perhaps intimidating for your new, newer um, gull watcher, but there's always a lot of information there. And it just gets you looking at gulls, seeing gulls more frequently, especially if you're on Facebook. For now. So I would say, Get to your local gull watching hotspot, find it, go there, spend some time, bring a lawn chair, uh, bring <laughs> flannel lined pants, 
in a down-filled vest, if it's winter, good warm gloves, heating pads for your boots, and you know, sit down or just stand around and just watch the gulls around you. If you go to Barry, as I said, you can have the spectacle right now with, with all those emerald shiners, large uh, numbers of Bonaparte gulls coming in, herring gulls, um, and, and rarer gulls will show up here to feed on these wonderful emerald shiners, which are really the star. I won't say that they're sort of the star attraction, but they're the reason that the gulls are, are coming in. So the gulls are just there waiting. Um, they're not waiting for us, but there's a great opportunity for us to see them and see them well and to uh, just get used to them. So I would uh, like to thank you very much for uh, joining me here and I'm not sure what I have to do here Sarah Rupert. Well I'm back on now so thank you so much for um, sharing all of this with us so um, I think we'll open it up for a few minutes of questions if anyone's got a question uh, that hasn't been answered you can put it into our chat box and I'll be happy to get Justin to answer those for you. Um, right. I want to just thank you off. Um, it's always great. Um, I always learn something new whenever we talk about gulls. And um, so we have some people talking about, you know, if you go to Barry, you can see Pacific loons, potentially Harlequin ducks. I'm going to put my shout out for going to Sarnia Bay. Somebody had posted that earlier on. And the St. Clair River in the winter is another great spot. And you don't have to pay for parking there. So that's also another good spot to go looking at gulls. Uh, someone wants to know uh, what you think of the book Gulls Simplified. Gulls Simplified. Hold on a moment. Hold that thought. Gulls Simplified. Okay, so I'll be very honest. I brought some of my gull books here. And um, Gulls Simplified, I mean, there are in-depth gull books you can get. I mean, there are, there is, a, you know, Gulls of the Americas from Peterson. There's Gulls of Europe, Asia, North America. There's also Gulls of the World book and the Gulls Simplified book, which is the one being referred to. Um, to be totally, totally, totally honest, I have not really uh, looked in depth at the Gulls Simplified book in the sense of I haven't kind of read through it and critiqued it to any degree yet. Um, what I can tell you about gull books, and, and you know, this is one of those I would say certainly is if you're if you're really a a, a gull, um, you really have fallen in love with gulls. These books are these are these books are really very I would say most helpful for for those who are sort of gull um, gull gull aficionados. If you if you're just getting started in gulls, I don't think you need one of these books. And I'm sorry to I'd say that to the you know I don't want the publishers on my case here. I don't think you absolutely need one of these books. I think there's a couple of books that I would recommend, other than those two that I showed you. Um, you know, the Identify Yourself by Bill Thompson. III. I think the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds in North America, fantastic book. I think everyone ought to have that, especially if you're kind of beginner to gulls, because it. it portrays gulls in all the gulls in naturalistic poses. They kind of, they look like they would in the field to me. Like they're obviously, they're, they're composites. They're sort of the most average gull for each species, but they look to me, they, they just look like that's what the bird looks like typically. And it also has a very good write-up. So I'm sorry I don't have my copy to show you of the National Geographic Field Guide. Um, and the Sibley Guide is also good when the Sibley Sibley uh, really compare, lets you compare gulls side by side in the same poses. So it's a bit more of a scientific approach to gull identification. But I think those two, if you have those two guides, um, if you don't have the National Geographic, get that one. If you're really, really into gulls and you just want to, you want to, you want to learn more information, more of the subtleties, I think a book like Gull Simplified will have that. Um, and the other thing is a book like Gulls Simplified has a lot of great images of, you know, many images of the same species in different poses. So it gives you a, a feel for the gulls. And um, I mean, it'll give you a lot of identification tri tricks as well and tips. But I think the thing is, and, and it also has a lot of comparison photos where it's comparing, you know, this gull that you're looking at with the gulls that are sitting around it of a different species. So you have that opportunity here too. And 
Um, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot in there. You can probably learn a lot from this book. I think it's not a book certainly to read from cover to cover, but if you just want to sit down, I mean, if you want to, to use it as a reference, it's, it has a lot of information there. But I think what's good about this book is you can just sit down with it and, and look at the, you know, Sabin's goal. And I just want to like really look at it and look at the iron color and the, the bill and the head, and, you know, where the black on the head is coming down to, is it down here or up here? The subtleties really are conveyed beautifully in a book like Golf Simplified. So I think it's your all, it's a great all round book. If you're a golf aficionado, um, if you think you're, you've been uh, taken, smitten by goals, I would say it's a good book to have. If you're a book collector, you have to have it. Um, there is another book by Amar Ayash coming out from uh, Houghton Mifflin, I think, which is the Gull Guide. It's supposed to be coming out in uh, early 2022. Look up Amar Ayash. And uh, that promises to be a, another great guide as well. Amar runs the, the North American Gulls Facebook page, and he's been working on it hard for uh, a little while. So that's my, my short sh spiel on gull books. Awesome. Um, somebody's asking if you recommend using a spotting scope for gull watching. Do I recommend using a spotting scope? Um, I think if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, um, I want to say if you're serious in the sense of if you want to look at far away gulls, I think it will be essential, which means you're like, you think you're going to be in a situation like maybe certainly at the Niagara Gorge, you need a spotting scope. But the thing is, Niagara Gorge, in the Niagara Gorge and on the river, things can be quite far. It's almost like they're always going to be very far. Um, not necessarily, but very often they're, they're quite far. So if you want to get good views of the bird, then you should have a scope. Now, do you always need to carry your scope with you? Not necessarily. Like if you're going to go to Centennial, it was Centennial Park and Beach in Barrie. I'm sorry, I forgot the name. I blanked on that. You know, where the gulls are on the docks in front of you, you don't necessarily need a scope. If you just want to go and kind of work on your gulls, and if you're in that kind of location, it's, it's helpful to have a scope if you really need it, but you don't necessarily need to carry it around. If you're lucky to be in one of those locations, then you may not even need a scope. But at a certain point, I think if you're serious about gulls, you will find that you will be at a disadvantage in not having one. Yeah. So I would say, if you get a scope, invest in a good one. Um, scopes like binoculars, I mean, you <laughs> you get what you pay for, so really it's an investment. But if you're gonna be really serious, I would think you need to have a scope at some point. Yeah, one of the things we um, had is, and it's, if you don't have an offset mount, if it's a flush, like a straight mount scope, um, we used to use a um, window mount in our cars in the winter, which was great because you didn't have to stand outside in the freezing cold um, when you wanted to look at gulls through the telescopes. So it's that's another option too that's out there for people. Um, there was a question about will the presentation be um, available on the OFO site or the YouTube site. We're going to be putting it up on OFO's YouTube site, um, but we'll make sure that there's links on the website as well. So if you want to go back um, and review this presentation, you can do it on Facebook or you can do it on our YouTube page. Uh, somebody's asking about National Geographic versus Petersons. National Geographic versus Petersons. I, um, I have the an older Petersons. I don't have the newer one. I would say the Petersons will have all the species. It'll have the range maps. Um, to my recollection, it'll have good descriptions. I hate to play favorites, I really do, but I do think the National Geographic is the better book because of the variety of uh, illustrations it has. Once again, the naturalistic feel of the, the illustrations. And as well, it has, if I recall correctly, it has all the ages that are all kind of side by side next to each other in nice poses looking like you would see them in, you know, Wheatley Harbor in that same, it gives you that feel that you're looking at them for real in the field. And because of that, I think there's more, it's a richer guide. It's, it's, it's a richer field guide for the illustrations. Yeah, it really, when the National Geographic guide came out in the, in the early eighties, it just bumped the bar up, especially in the gull section. Um, uh, coming from, you know, a dad who was obsessed with gulls and had every gull book imaginable then, um, 
we were using the National Geographic as a reference um, because the images were so good. Yep. All right. Um, we're kind of losing steam with questions. I'm going to just put it out. Does anyone have any additional questions? Um, somebody recommends Harrison Seabirds of the World. Um, yep, love that book. Have it. Um, actually, I think it's in the room with me right now in my art studio because I like to refer to it from time to time. Grant Skulls is also another uh, terrific girl publication as well that's older but still rel still has some great imagery and insights into it. Uh, somebody was saying that National Geographic Bird Book was their university textbook. So, all right. Well, I think we're winding down for the night. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate you all coming out tonight. Um, uh, as you may have seen, if you've been on the OFOS Facebook page or on our website today, our Winter Bird Challenge has started today. Oh, somebody's asking if we can do a presentation like this on Shorebirds. We'll add it to the list. So absolutely, it's uh, we're looking at um, developing more webinars like this. So we'll definitely put shorebirds on the list. So stay tuned. We'll we'll get something together for you. Um, so just to let you all know, the Winter Bird Challenge has started today. You can visit our Facebook page or our website. It goes right through till the end of February. All you have to do is go birding in your um, your local area and share your checklists on eBird with OFO, and there's opportunity for great prizes um, and all kinds of other fun stuff involved. So um, thanks everyone for coming out tonight, and a big thank you to you too, Justin. Uh, we really appreciate you taking your time tonight, and have a great evening, everyone, and go see some gulls. Thank you.